Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India start this lecture with a thought process uh, that is the demon of materialistic development is going to kill all life forms on this beautiful earth that can be saved only by re-establishing cordial relationship with mother nature through ancient environmental tools. So, if you look at in the last lecture we basically discuss about how this environmental consciousness has been embedded on the minds of Indians and still it is there, but it has been camouflaged by the modern materialistic way of life, but however, it is still lying inside and we need to uh, revive it and for that, we need to look at what are the environmental policies were in ancient India and which can be helpful for us to have a cordial relationship with mother nature, so that we can really lead a very peaceful, purposeful and fruitful life. Now also coming back to the Vedic era, during which a lot of things were happening, because that is the ancient text uh, we are having and that is not the ancient in the uh, India, but it is one of the ancient scriptures uh, in the entire world. So, during Vedic era, people were conscious of adverse pollution effects of in indiscriminate destruction of plants and forest. And uh, therefore, they had prescribed various ways to protect and clean off of the environment. Of course, that technique what they were using is yajna. But today, a lot of people are doing research and but however, uh, that has to be re-established whether that is uh, making the environment cleaned or not and some of the research has already been done, but uh, some of people are accepting that those facts or some are not accepting those more research need to be done on that front about the effect of jaggins on the atmosphere. And uh, if you look at as far as Veda is concerned, they were uh, considering the all living and non-living parts of the mother nature as divine and that is also still there in our uh, back of our mind. And Rig Veda highlights the potentialities of nature in controlling the climate which uh, modern uh, science has already proved it and increasing fertility improvement of human life emphasizing for intimate kinship with nature. See, this is a very important aspect. We are human beings and also having a relationship, ambiosical or biological relationship with the mother nature. So, we are part and parcel of nature. Therefore, our uh, scripture says, Mata Bhumi Putram Putibhyam. So, Atharveda considers trees the abode of various gods and goddesses as I had discussed in the last lecture. And Yajurveda emphasizes that relationship with nature and animals should not be that of dominion and subjugation, but a mutual respect and kindness. That is very important aspect what we need to look at it, because we should not uh, feel proud that we are powerful and so that we will dominate over other animals and species and rather we should be protector of them than that of destroyer of those things. There are several Puranas which have talked about uh, environment, how to protect it and a lot of rule regulation kind of thing, but however, I will be quoting some of them uh, according to the text Vishnu Sanita. If anybody uh, cause any harm to plants or animal, that is considered as a sin, even polloning or stealing of parts or products of any of these living beings is a considered to be a crime. But today we do not, because the people do that for beautification, other thing they just uh, spoil the 
vegetations and plants and other things that I have seen without really thinking about that they are having life. The sinner and criminal is liable to chastisement in this life and also after that because as for our scriptures we believe in the next birth and also the previous birth. So therefore, uh, we will have to be careful about that if we are doing any crime and that is act as a deterrent for not indulging in crime. But unfortunately, that, uh, that uh, faith has gone with the wind of this modern science and technology. So therefore, it's, uh, the society is in deep trouble. And the punishments of diverse nature, it can be pecuniary, corporal, expiratory and donation. Pecuniary means related to basically paying fines. Corporal means like it can be uh, like uh, by certain uh, kind of punishment can be given. Expiratory like it can do uh, some kind of a penance kind of thing and then uh, so that you will rectify it. And donation of course, you will have to pay money for the certain of specific articles or this thing to Brahmins because they are the uh, people who are having at that time were having educators, they were educators at the time, also they are taking care of the society in a very larger perspective and they are considered to be spiritual in nature. So, in uh, scriptures, our scriptures, there are some indirect instruction too, which can be gleaned by analyzing dietary regulations. This is a very unique to Indian scriptures that you will have a uh, control over your impulses by uh, having uh, certain kind of uh, diets because that controls your sense organs and other things. So, they use a biodiverse in different religious right because as I told you uh, in the last lectures, it has been integrated with our day to day life through rituals, through different uh, religious rites so that it is not kind of considered to be a different or rules in the books kind of thing. So, that we will see as you go along. And other scriptures namely Skanda Puran, Baraha Puran and others prescribed unnecessary killing of animals and preservation of forest and mountain. And according to Agni Puran, an old injection is to protect trees to earn religious merit and to ensure material prosperity of family because uh, family was considered to be very important in Indian society at that time and uh, so also the uh, religious or the spiritual thing. Therefore, they have connected it to that uh, so that people will follow it. And uh, if you look at today, the sustainable is a barge word, but in ancient time, the sustainable was a part and parcel of human life in terms of technology, in terms of other activities what they do. According to William James, who has defined the sustainability as a basically consumption or employment of resource, which all other factors being equal does not cause depletion that harms the resource or the constitute a threat to the ecosystem's integrity. Integrity of the ecosystem is very important. You can use certain resources, but it has to be uh, used in a such a way that it should not affect the growth uh, of the ecosystem what we are having. It should not spoil it any manner. So, uh, if you look at uh, the Indian scriptures like uh, Veda, Jain, uh, text of Jain and Buddhist, Puranas, Agamas, Manusmritis and others, the most authenticate uh, the things which we will be discussing in Kautilya's Arthasastra has already established the principles of sustainability for a long time back. It is not that you know something today they are talking about. And uh, we will be basically discussing about uh, mainly the Manusmati which is uh, around uh, something 1250 BC and it was a very great treatise and is one of the uh, oldest treatise about the rule and regulation what uh, human beings should follow in a society. So, that is a very important point we should uh, keep in mind. Also, of course, uh, Kotali Arthasastra is more is another important uh, text what we are having today to really consider that as a part of our uh, study what we are doing right now. So, if you look at Chanakya, 
uh, was around something 370 to 283 BC. He was a guru or a professor in Taxasila University and Kotalya is other name of Chanakya. He was instrumental in uh, organizing the all the uh, people at that time uh, and uh, could unite also most of parts of India under political domain called Mauryan Empire under the leadership of the Chandragupta Maurya that uh, because at that time Alexander was invading India and he could uh, manage to uh, stop him in, uh, in the frontier of India. And uh, the Arthasastra by Chanakya written around 321 BC and contains provision to regulate number of aspects related to environments which we will see some of them not all. This, after that also that legacy continues uh, Asoka like who is a very great emperor and who had uh, propagated the Buddhism across the globe. He has written lot of things about environmental protection particularly in his edicts and he had prohibited hunting, destroying of forests, advocate vegetarianism and he had established hospitals not only for human beings even for animals. Of course, Asoka was considered to do that but according to me it might be there much before that particularly uh, as you get evidence in the Chanakya's Arthasastra about taking care of animals in that treatise. If you consider the animal welfare, Chanakya's Arthasastra is uh, basically uh, always uh, having consideration for appointment of high ranking officials to look after the issues related to animal. Animal uh, welfare if you look at he considered to be in the three categories, one is director of forests like of course in modern terminologies and supervisors of animal slaughter and superintendent of cattle, horses, elephants and pastures because that is a very important point what uh, uh, they had taken care through administrative ways. And if you look at the duties of these welfare officers at the time and also what he had prescribed in the Arthasastra is basically protection of the reserve forest and uh, preventing cruelty of animals and preventing poaching uh, also that was the, their duties basically of these welfare officers of wild animals. So, if you look at uh, they had a provisions for taking care of elephants because they were using elephants for warfare also and they had uh, formed a reserve forest for elephants that was a ritual at that time usual way and uh, capital punishment for killing healthy elephants not that they were not killing elephants suppose some elephant will go mad they were used to uh, kill them to protect other people. Animals within the reserve found to be harmful were supposed to be taken away before killing them. Right, that was uh, being according to Arthasastra, these are the volumes and page number what is given. And uh, as I told that elephant were used for warfare also, but they were taken uh, care uh, very much and so that they will be strength enough to carry out this uh, the assigned jobs during the war. And if you look at uh, the number of species which are threatened is around today 16,938, large number of species are being extinct by this modern development. And uh, this concept was uh, there to protect the species and I will not uh, tell you the list of protected species of animals, birds and fish which are being mentioned in Arth uh, Arthasastra and also uh, Manismritis because it will be little boring to read out all those things or to and some of them names also we are not aware. So, uh, in killing of such species the protected area was punishable offence at that time and which uh, today also uh, be a part of our environmental laws and animals within the park found to be harmful as I told earlier were supposed to be taken away before killing them. And, uh, these some of the species I have shown here which is basically engendered animals in the modern day in, in India and, uh, and some of them might not be there at this moment even like uh, because 
and if you look at uh, there are several rules uh, being framed at that time for protecting animal. If an animal is struck with a blow which causes it pain, the offender should be punished with a fine in proportion to the amount of pain caused to that animal, right. That is according to Manuskruti and uh, meat eater is more guilty than the slayer of animal according to Manuskruti that I have given volume and 34 slokas. And uh, we know nowadays drivers are very careless and they can cause any damage to anybody as if they are the owner of the entire road that you can uh, feel whenever uh, you are a pedestrian or a cyclist or any other low level uh, or uh, low speed vehicle you are driving. At that time, if a careless driver of cart uh, inflict a, any person and they will be uh, asked to give a punishment on the fiscal, fiscal means the money wise, who causes the death or injury of any living being such as man, cow, uh, elephant, camel, horse or a small cattle, even a beautiful wild quadruped, birds, donkey, sheep, goats, dog and pig. So, most of the animals whatever is there, they have mentioned also, if you make any injury or you are a, uh, instrumental in making an injury or a death, then you will have to pay money for that uh, as a punishment. So, and uh, if you look at uh, the cow was considered revered at that time and today also, although we are not taking a, a cow nowadays, a cow should be protected from any sort of danger and any injury caused to cow should be followed with penance at that time like people were subjected to penance by the society. Because I remember when I was a kid, if anybody will try to you know cause any damage to the cow, then he himself or herself will be taking this penance and if he, he or she will not, then the society will uh, impose on that. So, that was a deterrent which was a part of that and uh, if you consider that uh, the care for animal was a part and parcel of life. Of course, there is a rules like conservation of animals referred to non-killing of animals either wild or domesticated for the purpose of food or sympathy or from ethical point of view. Any point of view you cannot do damage or to kill the animals, right. Special attention uh, were given at that time for domesticated animals to make them free from torment like you might have seen nowadays even some people are using uh, animals for uh, transport other things, they are very cruel to them. It was not at that time and for that rule were made and this is according to Manismriti and Artha Sasa says that even the strayed protected animals or those from the reserve forest found grazing at places and where they are not supposed to be should be driven off without hurting them. But today like the people kill if the, some of the animals are entered into somebody else territory which is really uh, not there at that time, we need to adopt that. And stray cattle should be driven up with a rope or a whip, people trying to attack such animals should be prevented from doing so by all available means and those found to hurt the cattle should be fined heavily. So, Artha Shastra according to Artha Shastra. And, uh, particularly for sick animals uh, are to be taken care and uh, sick animals should be treated by physician, they should be given proper quality and quantity of ration as specified in the, uh, their text. And I remember that uh, Arthur Sasa has prescribed uh, the particularly for elephants and other animals, the what kind of ration will be provided by the king in their place. So, those things has to be followed and herdsmen should be responsible for proper care of animals otherwise they will be punished. So, uh, if you look at the king's duty was to protect the forest and not only the forest, but elephants, flower gardens, vegetable gardens, fruit orchards, weight crop, fields should be protected by king. That was the duty of the king to protect this, but today who protects? <laughs> you know that is another question comes into picture. 
So, it is very laid down that what should be. If you look at uh, care for tree was a part of parcel of life, beside this they have also formulated some rules like cutting of suits of uh, flowering or fruit bearing trees or the ones which provide shade was prohibited. But today people just uh, uproot or then cut the trees vehemently without thinking. Cutting of branches and trunk of such trees was prohibited for beautification people are doing nowadays. And according to Manishmriti, plants are declared as conscious. See, this idea might have taken by Jagdish Chandra Bose, the scientist who has contributed about uh, this aspect. And, uh, and that was also entered into the minds of people. That is why you will have to conserve the plants and conservation of plants refer to non-spoilage of any plant, plant part or plant product for no good purposes. You can take for a food, that is okay. You can take for your medicine, but you cannot cut it for beautification. You know, nowadays people are doing gardening, they cut it. How can you cut that thing? So, you can use it. If you can use, then you, it is okay. And otherwise, they are having life. They are also conscious about that. And uh, care for usually neglected, like damage to even bushes, creepers, wearing flowers, fruits was also penalized. Right? Today, people are doing without thinking what they are doing but they do. So, if you look at it, it is not that uh, isolated rule and regulation which are there in the textbook or maybe something uh, law books, but it was important was given for the human society. Because human society is an integral part of environment and any society without proper civic order or the rules cannot be an ideal society. So, therefore, the civic rules were being framed and it has been injected into the mind, into their rituals, into their customs, into their life, so that they will follow it. The glimpses of what was the idea of civic order in ancient India can be seen in Chanakya Thetais, Arthasatra and also the Manusmati and the various Puranas. Because if you look at the earlier days, the temple were the learning center uh, for the mass of the people who are being educated how to live a life without really uh, not affecting the environment adversely, rather live with the environment peacefully. So, therefore, these Puranas were playing a very important role for them to get into the psyche. Unfortunately, today we do not have that education system. Temples are not become center of uh, learning, they become center of money making machines, money making uh, systems. So, that is a sad part of it and it deals in detail with uh, civic order required to be implemented in the state like uh, this Manusmati and Ch Chanakya Tritais and uh, there are several other scriptures which are talked about it. So, uh, Chanakya Arthasatra on civic sense if you look at it is basically includes the three aspect one is town planning, waste disposal protection of trees and animal life, protection of public properties was very important. So, all are being taken care, some of them will be just touching upon because it is not possible to really uh, discuss it at length due to the paucity of time. And uh, let us look at the approach taken in Arthasas to maintain civic orders aims at a precursion rather than solution, rather than the solution in the sense, solution will be evolve out of it, but the precaution is more better than even the implementing that because right to the pollution of water bodies, atmospheres and environment in general. That means, they were formulating the laws, rituals and together and rights such that the pollution of water body, atmosphere and environment in general are being taken care by the people at large. Of course, when the people will not take care, then the law implementing agencies like king and other administrator will be taking care of that through punishment. So, let us look at these aspect one by one, we will be looking some of them, not all. If you look at uh, how they were supposed to achieve the civic order, the, the as I told is the town planning and the protection of common resources and waste disposal. And uh, if you look at houses where uh, should be constructed in such a way that there is a sufficient space between neighboring houses. 
but today it is not and we do not really uh, keep the space for uh, plantation and other things and all the space we are using for making houses and we are rather encroaching the road so that it will be free for us and that is the thing what is going on today and which is very unfortunate and parking spaces, fireplaces, water storage, grinding mills, threshing devices should be placed sufficiently away from the boundaries of the houses so that they will be other people will not be disturbed and then uh, people will be at peace right that is a very important aspect what is not being done today and uh, if you look at town planning when people are doing they are being uh, taking care such so that construction of outside projecting staircases ladders ditches water channels near the houses should be avoided rather it was not being uh, being done at that time. I have just shown like in the street in Sisupalga in Odisha which is a very ancient uh, street what people have excavated. You can see the roads are quite wider, but if you look at this street in modern day uh, Baranasi is so narrow that you cannot think of. So, that is the things what we are doing today, but earlier the people were not doing that. Any conflict between house owners should be solved by mutual consensus rather than going to the court and then you know doing that today a lot of people are involved in court cases and the advocates and other people are just swindling them and they are also getting a lot of pain in the process worries and loss lots are being thrust upon them and due to their uh, indulgence in this kind of conflict going to so uh, if you look at waste disposal uh, i will be now discussing little bit about manasmat is what they say Manusmati says that garbage like hair, ashes, bones, posters, cotton seeds, chaff are not to be dumped in public places and one should avoid to step on over such places where it can be disposed of. And, uh, but uh, today what we do is uh, we just keep in the, on the street, if you look at the street I have shown here, how people are uh, seamlessly place these garbages as if they are not part of it, they are part of it. So, urination on public road, on access, in a cow pan, ploughed land, in water facing to fire, in a ruined temple, in ant hill or in holes inhabited by living creatures or on a hill top should be avoided as per the Manu Smriti and waste products like urine, audio, water used for washing the feet, water from the bath, remnants of food should be made transfer far away from the dwelling place. What do we do? We just dump by the side of others house and then <laughs> and also on the road. See this, this small small things we do not do that and we think that uh, the government should do and then that is the thing. So, uh, that should enter into our mind and filthy substance like urine, faces, saliva, cloth defiled by impure substances, blood, poisons thing and any other substance considered to be impure should not be thrown to water bodies. But what do we do? We just put and uh, that became a part of our rituals nowadays and people do not understand what they are doing. It is being not only prohibited in Manasmati, I remember that it is also prohibited in Vedas, right? In Puthi Sukta, he has talked about. And he who draws filth on the king's high road should be fined and asked to clean immediately. Under the condition of urgent necessity, this punishment is relaxed for an age old man or a pregnant woman or a child. There is a relaxation for uh, this kind of people who may not uh, be penalized that much or may be relaxed. So, if you look at throwing disposal, throwing of dirt and collection of wastewater on the road was prohibited and uh, punishable according to the Arthasastra and urinating defecting in the around holy places, water bodies, royal properties was prohibited and punishable by law according to uh, Arthasastra. Household wells, water courses and dung hills should be placed at a specified location, right. At that time also the people were having a compost that is the cow dung hill they were making so that they can use for the as a manure, but that should not be kept nearby the houses it will be little far away. 
flow of water channels during the rainy season should not be obstructed by anybody and this is according to Artha Sastras. I have not mentioned here, but it is Artha, but if you look at what we are doing today, even that stray animals are affected by this plastics and other garbages we are putting. So, we are doing really not only spoiling our health, we are also spoiling the health of other animals and uh, water. If you look at lot of filthy substance are placed on this uh, water which uh, probably I have taken from the Ganges, which is the holy river according to us. So, that is the thing what we are doing, disposal of dead bodies, dead bodies of domesticated animals were not allowed to be disposed anywhere in the city, it has to be far away in the uh, allocated places. And uh, I have just shown you a cremation guard in Banaras, how badly it is just by the near of the Ganges or the river Ganga, because the people call it as holy, but they are spoiling the holy river and human dead bodies were supposed to be carried through the prescribed route to the location of designated for the cremation or burial, not that you will take the way you want. So, that that is the things what uh, uh, according to Arthasastra we should follow and also you should be kept and people should be educated why they should not do that. And it is not only that individual, the community is very important. And uh, that community feeling today is not there because people think they are independent with the materialistic prosperity, but people can never be independent, they cannot be dependent, they should they, they can be dependent, rather I will put we are all interdependent. That philosophy, the concept we should keep in mind. Everyone had to contribute his share for the building of community facilities, which is today not there, we want to use it, but we do not want to contribute. Preventing others to lawful use of those facilities was prohibited and damaging such facilities was punishable offence at that time. Even today it is there, but we do not follow it. Sets, courtyards, latrines, fireplaces, places for pounding grains, all open places were regarded as common property, so that people can use it together. It is not that uh, it will be used by some people alone. So, when you look at these uh, Arthasastras and Manusmritis and other Puranas, you will find there are several rules which are there for the uh, environmental protections. Of course, it has not been mentioned it is for environment, but however, you can glean through it and find out that is for environment. And let us look at what are the basic tenets of these rules which are being present talked about in this manuscript, uh, in this text or the scriptures. The ancient laws are basically ethical, mostly educative, to be implicated from biological, social, physiological and philosophical point of view, enriching the environment to be considered in total. It is not separate, right? it is a part of our life. So, that is being considered from all aspects. These laws originated in three forms, what we can couch it into one is ethical dictum or those laws were presented in a form of advices and code of conduct not to commit any environmental sin or any sin uh, even from society point of view. I am not talking about the environmental rules and offensive dictums if you look at their anti-environmental activities are declared as punishable and punishment was also prescribed in those scriptures like and self restriction dictum is very vital uh, for a society to be a participatory in nature and taking responsibility for that and a committer of environmental sin is asked to undergo penance for prevention of committing a mistake uh, not to repeat the activities subsequently to create a self consciousness self humiliation on account of coupled with a guilty feeling. See, it is a guilty feeling is been embedded into uh, their mind that if you commit this thing, because you will get a uh, punishment either in this birth or in the next birth, because we believe in the rebirth. So, uh, and it is a part of that they will take the penance themselves. And another way is that if they are not doing, their family members will take care of it or ask them or casual them to take. If their family is not taking or the village or the community will ask them to 
undertake so that other it became a deterrent for others not to commit such kind of mistakes and they will feel self pity for that because it is a part of their life. So let us look at this thing has happened uh, that period in the medieval periods what happened. If you look at Mauryan and the Guptan empires and other things the environmental protection was very much there. And it is not only the uh, Mauryan and the Gupta empire and uh, others like uh, Cholas and uh, Pandyas and other things they were doing. But the other Hindu kings also prohibited killing of animals and destruction of forest and flora and fauna. But when we started losing the control over that, particularly after the fall of Gupta dynasty, the Indian peninsula lost substantial forest and environmental plundering due to political instability and invasion of Muslims because they were very ruthless. They are not bothered about the forest, they are not bothered about environment. Till Akbar uh, could manage to consolidate the Mughal empire around the 16th century and there was some order in the across the country, particularly the territory controlled by Ak Emperor Akbar. And during Mughal era, no attempts was made on environment conservation as they did not ever realize the need for it because they were not concerned about that and they were not uh, aware that what is the importance. And for Mughal rulers and other officials, forest mean no more than a wooded lands where they could hunt and collect some revenue. And at that time of course, the uh, small scale industries were being started. So, they were using some of the products from this forest. And however, there was a restriction cutting of some specific royal trees, particularly in their garden because they were uh, really uh, very much enjoying the life, uh, royal people particularly. And Mughals were not forest minded people like the Hindus or the uh, earlier uh, Indians as such. They created exquisite gardens, fruit orchards, green parks round about their palaces, central and provincial headquarters for recreation purposes. Right. It was not common people who were being encouraged, they were aware. Of course, it, the other people could have learned from that, that is another thing. But uh, they were not uh, basically interested in developing forest or protecting forest. But during the time of Sher Sasuri, the period uh, between Bavar and uh, Akbar, uh, who uh, ruled over this country for a very short period, he had done some work. The plantation of trees along the Delhi and Patna highway was being undertaken and so also the development of road, the Patna Delhi highways and lot of water bodies also was being revived by the Sher Sasuri, which were there since the a time of Emperor Asoka and also Mauryan Empire like Chandraguptas, later on Guptas also developed, but he, it was all dilapidated condition he tried to revive. That is a great thing he did according to me. And uh, unlike the elephant forest of Mauryas, Mughals selected different areas of imperial hunting grounds in different provinces. And uh, this uh, whatever I am going to quote, I have taken from Rangarajan Mahesh, India's wildlife history book. And uh, during the first 12 years of uh, reign of Jahangir, he had killed over 17,000 animals, which included as many as 8, 8, 9 Nil guys, 86 tigers and lions, 1,670 gazelles, antelopes. At one stage, there was about 12,000 elephants in the possession of Emperor Jahangir. Uh, of course, this number I may attribute, they might be using it for warfare, what also the Mauryans had doing. But this data I have taken from Rangarajan Mahesh, their book. And Gupta period, uh, 206, witnessed a distribution of forest, whereas the Mughal period witnessed continuous destruction of both flora and fauna in the subcontinent for timber and clearance of green cover for cultivation. Because the Mughal rulers, had uh, developed a lot of uh, about the agricultures and they were trying to generate revenues through agriculture. So, they have taken lot of land for cultivation purposes and they had also started at, as I had mentioned a small scale industries to generate more revenues. 
So, therefore, they were also using the forest materials for that. But however, Marathas and Gonds, when they took over uh, some of the lands from the Mughals, uh, they planted mangoes, other useful trees along their marching routes, halting places, some of which are still surviving according to some researcher. And uh, the Mughals were only indifferent to the forest or the flora and fauna. However, the early British administration were predators. That means they were just vouching on them as they destroying it. The only concern of the early British administrator in the Indian forest was to secure big supplies of teak and other timber for the Royal Navy and other business activities. Of course, I feel that it is maybe Mughals might have started, but the British people did it more vigorously. So, no steps were taken for the forest protection, conservation except his exploitation. And uh, keep in mind that there is a rule which was uh, promulgated by Britishers to drive the uh, Adivasis, Banwasis from the this land which are being uh, from the forest, which are being protected by them. And they were also using them. It is not that they were the product misingly without really spoiling it. In later part, the British people also developed the mixed forests like develop the uh, forest which are having single species. Earlier days, the forest means various species were there. And these mixed forests were replaced by single species, commercially valued trees such as teak, sal, pine, devadar, just to retain India as a supplier of cheap raw materials and a market for a higher price manufacturing goods. So, that they were very commercial in mind and the naturally the forest will be basically the uh, having trees of varieties. The biodiversity is being maintained, this is monoculture what they have, bring, they have brought in and uh, that has really created the imbalance in the ecosystem. So, and the British officers and soldiers in the cantonment were encouraged to spend their vacation acquiring more trophies in killing animals, look at this. That means, if those officers could manage to kill animals in the forest while they are on the recreation, they will be given hours. And then naturally people then they were having gun and then uh, this atrocities on the animals. As a result, we lost a lot of animals during this period. I will just give you some data which uh, I have taken from this book written by Rangarajan Mahesh, India's wildlife history. Over 80,000 tigers, more than 1,50,000 leopards, 2 lakh wolves were slaughtered in the 50 years from 1875 to 1925. So, these are basically data which are taken and this may be official data, but there might be several of them which could have been slaughtered, could have been killed without any account of it. You know. So, that is the thing what happened that naturally we lost everything in the process of that. So, primary aim of Britishers was to utilize the resources of colony to meet the industrial requirements in their home country and administrative expenditure in the colony. There basically was to do business and then plunder our country. And they formulated forest policy 1894 and took away the rights of tribal dwellers of the forest as I had mentioned earlier. And uh, till today also I think that rule is being followed in India, unfortunately. I may be wrong, uh, it might have changed, but if it has changed, it is a great thing. But it must be changed according to my own judgment, because the Adivasis are the people, the tribal dwellers should be a part and parcel of the forest and they should be taught not to uh, spoil the forest, rather consider them as a mother and use the resources. In 1864, first inspector general forest was appointed for resource exploration, forest fire protection and assessment of growing stock. See look at these are all commercial things. They were having more interest in the business. Of course, it is a good thing they had developed certain technologies and ways to protect the forest from fire damage. That is a good thing, but their main motive was to commercialized to make money. And in 1972, if you look at National Council for Environmental Policy and Planning was established, 
and subsequently became a separate in the Ministry of Environment and Forest in 1985. But I feel that uh, these policies people have made, it is a great thing, good thing. But however, uh, one has to also look at the our ancient policies, whatever being talked about, whatever being written in the uh, our scriptures like uh, Manusmriti, Puranas and uh, the Arthasastras and also it is there in the minds of uh, the people has to be considered in formulating the policies instead of uh, just propagating the ideas given by the earlier British rulers and those policies and also the policies being uh, talked about in the western countries, we need to relook at fundamentals and then modify those policies and it should be a part of our life not that it will be remain in the law books. So, in 1993 the environmental action program was formulated to improve the environmental services integrating the environmental consideration into development program. See this is the uh, problem what I find that people think development means materialistic development, means business and then commercialization. Whenever you do too much of commercialization, then the problem arises. So, therefore, we need to integrate these programs and policies related to environment such that the people will take care of it and people will be educated, it need not to be the be spoiled by the demons of development. And uh, national environment policy was formulated in 2006 for environmental protection in a comprehensive manner to identify causes of land degradation, finding out the remedial measures to restore it. Of course, a lot of work has been done, but the way people are looking today to protect the environment is uh, basically without really much uh, knowledge and uh, the ground reality what people are having and what they want to have and also people should be educated. And uh, this land degradation is uh, basically looked at from the agricultural point of view and also from the environmental damage being done by the uh, modern uh, science and technology and also the businesses what is going on. But however, one has to look at the fundamental aspect of how to re acclimatize or reclaim the land and uh, also refurbish it in a more natural way which will take more time because people are trying to have a faster development and faster more the faster development we want to have then naturally we will be having more problems of spoiling the environment. Because anything fast one wants to do, then we will be in deep trouble. So, rather we need to understand the underlying principles on which the mother nature works and work in unison with the mother nature. Some of the solution which were offered is basically uh, being enumerated here. The adoption of both science based and traditional land use practices. Now, people thinking that uh, science means modern science. It is not that uh, ancient India was having any science, it, they were having, but the traditional land use practices has to be restored. It is a good part that government of India has considered that, but unfortunately, uh, the traditional land use practices are not being implemented, although it was being done in 2006, that is something 12 years back. Uh, if you recall, I had mentioned about how the land were being classified according to the uses, particularly in villages, the land for pasture, land for your water bodies, land for temple, land for forest, land for houses. So, those things has to be uh, uh, implemented and to be a part of the uh, new rules what we are having and also it will be uh, communicated well to the people. The pilot scale demonstration of policies what uh, has to be 
done, but how what one has to demonstrate it, one has to look at it because when you talk about that thing particularly in rural areas, even in urban areas, this has to be done, the model has to be created such that how you can live a life in uh, unison with the mother nature, not damaging the nature, but rather in a symbiotic, developing a symbiotic relationship with it. Adoption of multi-stakeholder partnership, these are according to me basically uh, stakeholders and other thing is part of a business, but one has to also look at uh, the partnership that we will have to see that we are a part and parcel of nature. So, that has to be entered into the minds of the people and promotion of agroforestry and environmentally sustainable cropping patterns adoption of efficient energy tech irrigation techniques which all has to be naturally being made not with the modern irrigation techniques spoils the process imbalance uh, creates imbalance in the nature. So, agroforestry is uh, basically it is not the forest is important rather we will need to go back to the uh, village forest where like uh, you will have to protect the forest so that you can have uh, face the problem of uh, global uh, warming and climate change you can deter, you can really take care of that by developing. Let me conclude so what we can learn from uh, this uh, discussion that Indians had formulated environmental laws to overcome the problems of pollution, contamination and biodiversity and we need to relook at in modern eyes and see that how we can adopt. Ancient environmental laws were more of ethical significance as they could mold the people not to commit any offense against the ecology or the environment. This ancient laws had an option to undertake penance to realize the misdeeds and would not repeat them in future by self-realization and also uh, by social pressure. The king was also authorized to punish the offenders acting against the laid down environmental rules. In the today, we do not have king, we are having the rulers, democratic way uh, elected rulers are supposed to take care of that along with the officers. So, industry the spoil environment cannot be beneficial for humankind, therefore, we need to also develop such kind of thing and it is important that before really uh, establishing the industry, we need to uh, take care so that whatever the damage little being made by the industries should be uh, separately being replenished by uh, planting trees and other measures so that uh, ecological imbalance would not be there. So, we can learn a lot from uh, our ancient um, environmental rules and regulations and adopt that so that we can revive, rejuvenate the environment for the betterment of our entire humankind. Thank you very much.